ratio that you saw in your data set, but you give them a range of values built around your one best estimate. And that range gives you an idea of what types of associations are supported by these data. So unlike the test of significance, where the key question is, do the data support the confidence interval estimation? Basically, what you're doing is you're asking what hypotheses are being supported by the data set. So you might see in your data set that people with given the lifestyle intervention had half the risk of developing diabetes compared to people given a placebo pill. Therefore, you'd say, based on these data, this lifestyle intervention seems to cut your risk in half. This ratio is 0.5. But it also might be very supportive, not only of the statement risk ratio is 0.5, but also of the risk ratio of the statement risk ratio is 0.6, or risk ratio is 0.4. What the confidence interval is going to tell you is what statements about the true value of your risk ratio are being supported by your data. The way we construct these confidence intervals are usually based by assuming a normal distribution or a sampling distribution. And we'll talk about what I mean by those as we go through confidence intervals, especially what we might mean by a sampling distribution. But first, let's talk about tests of significance. And this is just a little diagram I put together that describes what types of tests of significance you will do for different types of outcomes. These are all crude tests of significance. Not, these are for unadjusted uh, associations between risk factors and your outcome. As, in other words, if your table two was a valid description of only the effect of the risk factor on the outcome, you didn't have to do a model to adjust for confounding factors. You wanted to talk about the significance of that relationship, well, you'd do one of these following tests in most situations. If your outcome was nominal, and the most basic nominal outcome is a binary outcome, dead or alive, diabetes or no, no diabetes, You'd be doing chi-squared tests, or maybe you'd be doing exact tests. If your outcome was continuous, sort of like whether a particular treatment improves your um, a particular biomarker as an early sign of, of, of disease progression, you might be doing t-tests, or you might be doing analyses of variance. If your outcome is ordinal in scale, your outcome is, how do you feel today? Excellent, very good, good, fair, poor, or stage of disease probably do something called a non-parametric test. So I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a flavor for all three of these tests today, but mainly talking about the chi-squared test as a starting point to talk about what a test of significance really does. Um, okay, let me uh, let me just do a, a check since um, I can't hear it. Am I still coming through okay? I mean, are you still there? Someone just responds. Hopefully I'm not just talking to myself today. Okay, everyone's still there. Great. I appreciate you, you hanging in there. Okay, let's talk about tests of significance in general. Remember what the test of significance is asking is how consistent is the data with the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that there's no association between your risk factor of interest or your intervention and your outcome. So the null hypothesis says the true risk ratio is 1. The true odds ratio is 1. The true risk difference should be 0. In other words, no association. The people who get the risk factor and the people who don't get the risk factor have the same risk of developing your outcome. The goal of significance testing is just to ask how consistent are your data with that null hypothesis. And it's very simple. You're going to have two options. Based on your test of significance, you can say, I reject the null hypothesis, which means you have a statistically significant result. Or you don't reject them. Now, in your mind, there's this alternative hypothesis. That was the main reason you did this study. The main reason Marjorie was involved in that large randomized trial to see if lifestyle intervention would prevent the, the development of diabetes is because they thought lifestyle intervention might be useful. They also thought that this drug metformin might prevent disease from occurring. So probably the motivation for doing this study was the hope and that the alternative hypothesis might be true, that the true risk ratio is not one, but different from one. In this case, in the previous study, would be less than one, suggesting a preventive benefit for people taking a lifestyle intervention or uh, a particular medication. So this was probably the real motivation for doing the study, but notice the Test of significance is only focusing on the null hypothesis. So 
And when you do a test of significance, you have two conclusions you can reach to end up saying statistically significant results. Typically, that means your p-value is less than 0.05. I'll talk about what a p-value is in a minute. That means you are rejecting the null hypothesis. You're saying your data is not consistent with the null hypothesis. And you might be making the correct conclusion or the incorrect conclusion. If the null hypothesis were actually true, you say you have a statistically significant result, you need to reject the null hypothesis, you're making a mistake. It's called a type 1 error or an alpha error. On the other hand, if the null hypothesis were not true, if the alternative hypothesis is true, and you are rejecting the null, you're making a correct statement. So by rejecting, you might be making a mistake or you might be doing the right thing. The same thing when we don't reject the null hypothesis, when we say our results are not statistically significant. Again, we might be making something correct or doing something incorrect. If the null hypothesis were true when we didn't reject it, we're making a correct statement. But if the null hypothesis were not true, the alternative were true, and we didn't reject the null, we are making what is known as a type 2 error or a beta error. Well, both errors are possible because you don't know whether the null hypothesis is in fact true or the null hypothesis is in fact not true. That's the reason you're doing this study. So you have to realize that you have the potential for making two types of errors. Well, if you only wanted to make one type of error, if you never wanted to make a type 2 error, what you could do is always reject the null hypothesis, regardless of the size of the p-value. Well, every p-value is statistically significant. Reject all the time. Even if the p-value is huge, 1.0, close to 1, you're going to reject it. And therefore, you're never going to make the mistake of not rejecting the null hypothesis when the alternative was true. You're never going to be making a type 2 error, but you'd always have the potential now of making a type 1 error because you're always rejecting the null hypothesis. And that's a bad thing. And on the other extreme, if you always did not reject the null hypothesis, You'd never make a type 1 error, but you'd always, always make a type 2 error. And it turns out that these two errors you make sort of are related to one another. As you increase your chances of making a type 1 error, you decrease your chances of making a type 2 error, and vice versa. Or another way of putting that, if you try to avoid making type 1 errors, you're increasing your chances of making a type 2 error. So how do statisticians get around this dilemma? They say, well, we can't get around the fact that you always have the potential of making both of these errors. So what I'll do is I'll declare something to be statistically significant, choose a threshold for my p-value. So my type 1 error has a defined value. It could be no bigger than, say, 5%. So you say if your p-value is less than 5%, you'll call something statistically significant. What that means is 5% of the time, when you call things statistically significant, you'll be making a mistake. But you're willing to live with that small risk of making a mistake. So I took this quote from one of my statistics. A statistician is a person whose lifetime ambition is to be wrong 5% of the time. Not 6% of the time, not 4% of the time, but 5% of the time. Because when you declare something statistically significant because of p-value, something we'll define in a few minutes, less than 0.05, and that's what's typically done by everybody, realize that you are potentially making a mistake by calling it statistically significant. When the null hypothesis is really, as we go back to the previous slide, is really true. You've got to be living with the chances of making this error by saying, I'm willing to live with a 5% chance of making that error. And that's what most statisticians will do. They'll call something statistically significant if your p-value is less than 0.05. So how do you get these p-values? Well, what you do is, based on your data, you develop something called a test statistic. I'll show you a few test statistics today. What that, what that test statistic is, is just a summary of how consistent your data is with the null hypothesis. You have a data set measuring the association between a risk factor and outcome. From that association, you calculate a, a value for a test statistic. Calculate the value for the chi-squared test, or the value for the t-test, or the value for the non-parametric test. That test statistic is summarizing in a single number how consistent the data is with the null hypothesis. And that test statistic was chosen because it, theoretically it has a predicted sample. Meaning, when the null hypothesis is true,